Funding for this program was provided in part by Religious Education at Brigham Young University. This address by Liz Swindle was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 29, 2005. I am often asked, did I have any idea that the work that was done on Joseph Smith, the paintings would become what they have, when I began with one painting, which was the martyrdom. There was no way to foretell that. And had I been able to, it probably wouldn't have become what it is today. I had a wonderful experience that taught me this several years ago. When Joseph Smith, Impressions of a Prophet, um, was produced, it was done locally. And we um, catered more to a local market, meaning mostly the region western United States. When we decided to do the new project, Son of Man, with Susan and Kenneth, we had hoped that we would be able to broaden our market and take it to a national level. That would not be able to be done going through the publishing company here at the time. And so we um, were, I was picked up by the, uh, the Greenwich Workshop out of Connecticut in order to bring this to pass. Part of my contract with the Greenwich Workshop, however, is that I would um, visit different galleries, their dealerships around the country, and share um, my experiences there. And, and the purpose would be to meet the owners of those dealerships and also those who were buying the paintings. And uh, when I originally signed, I thought that would be great because what we wanted to do was to be able to take the life of Jesus Christ from the Mormon perspective uh, to the world and have them do it in a way that Sherry, Day, Sherry Do uh, coined the phrase, help people to bump into the gospel. And uh, this was our goal. But the first assignment that I had was in Wichita, and that was several years ago. When I received the itinerary of what I would be doing there, I really went into panic mode. My itinerary stated that I would be there on a Saturday. My first assignment for the day is that I would be in the Blessed Angel of the Sacrament Church. I didn't see ward or stake attached to that anywhere. And that immediately put me <laughs> in a very nervous position. And, uh, and then I was later that day to go to the gallery that was hosting the event. The gallery was owned by a Catholic family. And, um, and so I was a bit nervous because along with that, it did not specify what I was going to be doing at the Blessed Angel of the Sacrament Church. It could be anything from debating with their pastor to uh, feeding the homeless. I didn't know, but, uh, but we went. But before doing that, I had about two weeks to prepare. And because this was early on in the project, much like with Joseph Smith, there was a lot of things that I was still learning and taking a crash course, if you will, in trying to gain as much information that I could so that when I was in the position of coming up against someone with questions that I would have those answer, answers. My fear was that I would come up against that and not have the answers and somehow that would bring um, a bad light upon the church. Because indirectly that is what I was doing was representing the church in that capacity. So we went after many prayers had been offered and sure enough, eight o'clock that Saturday morning, I was in the auditorium of the Blessed Angel of the Sacrament Church. I was placed in a booth that sat between someone selling rosary beads and another selling winged angels. Um, it just kept getting worse. <laughs> I had books there that they wanted me to push, and, and as people would go through those two hours, they were very taken with the artwork in the books. On the cover of the book was Mary and the Child Jesus, the Infant Jesus, and done in a way that most of them had not seen before, which was what our hope was and the interest grew, but as the question would always come up, where are you from, it was very hard to explain that from Utah and uh, not get past the question that I was Mormon. Um, it was assumed and for the most part, people would quickly try to leave. And that ended and already had put me on my guard. I was nervous because of the reception, 
When I arrived at the gallery, however, it did get worse. As I stood at the table, or as I came in, there was a woman standing at the table, her arms on her hips, her hands on her hips, ready for some questions to be answered. And the first question out of her mouth was, why did you paint his eyes blue? Now, the prayer went something like this, Heavenly Father, how do I explain to this Catholic woman that Alexander Nybar, the dentist of Joseph Smith, actually recorded that as one of the accounts of the first vision? I don't think it's gonna fly. Um, please help me put into my mouth, into my mind, what I need to say to this woman to diffuse where this is going. And it simply came out, and it seems like a no-brainer, but you know, when you're on the spot, it could be brain surgery. But I said, well, um, first of all, we know that he's only part Jewish. We're not sure what the other lineage is. And the woman said immediately, oh no, Joseph and Mary are both from the line of David. And I said, but Joseph wasn't his father. Wow. I could have invented some great invention there. She reared back on her heels, content with the answer, and said, you're absolutely right. She bought a lot of art, and she left. <laughs> a prayer was answered. Many prayers were answered. But it certainly had me in an anxious state of mind. And as the day progressed, I would meet more and more people waiting for that next person to come up and next um, thing to diffuse. But instead, the afternoon was, had become quite quiet. I was sitting at the table by myself, and a woman came through the door of the gallery clutching her purse. It's a good sign she wasn't from there. And as she walked in, something was different. Her countenance was different. It was the type of countenance that I recognize when I go to my ward every Sunday. And as she walked over to the table, she leaned over and whispered to me, are you Liz Lemon Swindle? And I said, I am. And she says, are you the Mormon Liz Lemon Swindle? <laughs> yes, I am. And then she spoke for a minute and said, I saw an advertisement in the airport that you were here, and I had to come. I had to find my way here. I only have a few moments. But I needed to tell you You will never know. The impact that you have had on people's lives through your paintings. I knew that she wasn't specifically speaking of Jesus Christ. There weren't enough paintings produced by that time. She was speaking specifically of Joseph Smith. She was sent for me because it was so early in this project. I needed the reassurance and the buoyancy in order to face the years that would follow. And I believe she was sent through those prayers to bring me that peace, comfort, and certainty of what I was doing and who I was doing it for. So in answer to the question, did I have any idea what Joseph Smith impressions of a prophet would become, the answer is not at all. But I do know this, I will be forever grateful for the role that I've been able to play in this work. I'm often asked, in fact, I gave a recent interview where I was asked the major influences in my life. There was one, there are several, and, but I will only name a couple today. One would be my father. He was supportive from the beginning. And uh, just a really fun story. Um, I had always wanted to be a fashion designer from the time I was a little girl. And I would present my father with endless numbers of fashion sketches from the time I was a little girl and until my teenage years. And he would put those on the refrigerator. As I would sketch those, my father would always follow with great praise and encouragement and, and how proud he was of me that I was using my talents. There was always that gentle and not so subtle hint, perhaps one day you might want to paint the prophets. Um, as a 12 year old, looking at that fashion industry and all the accolades that could bring, that really wasn't all that enticing to paint the prophets. However, 
he was my source of income until I was able to get a job of my own, so best to keep him happy. One day he suggested that perhaps I might want to paint a sketch of his dear friend and former mission companion, Harold B. Lee, and send that to him. And so I, I did that. I sent it, and within days, um, a letter came back from Elder Lee, and there was a $5 bill include, included with it. And uh, the letter stated something like this, the thanks for the sketch. Uh, he was very appreciative of it. He recognized there was talent here and reminded me that the talent that I had been given was from my Heavenly Father and to use it wisely throughout my life. And then a little quick adage, the $5 bill is uh, for you. Uh, perhaps you could buy some art supplies with the money. And uh, I thought, terrific, and I hurried out and bought mascara. My career has taken many courses. I have worked as a fashion designer. I have worked for a set painter for the Osmond Studios. And while there at the Osmonds, uh, because it was the television industry and new to Utah, it couldn't sustain itself full time. And so the artists that had been uh, um, enticed to come and work for them were having to take second jobs in order to uh, take over those times when they weren't in production. The big thing in the art world at that time was wildlife art. And it wasn't the, the typical wildlife art you see for the duck hunters. This was more uh, somebody stuffs a calico duck and then you paint it. And, uh, and so many of the artists were doing that, including myself. But it was always a little bit embarrassing to explain to those who thought I was actually working in this glamorous television studio that I was painting calico ducks. So I found the means to learn how to paint a duck anatomically correct. And now I had gained the skill to compete in the federal duck stamp. And that was about all it was good for. But uh, I luckily was picked up by a gallery in the Midwest. And there was a career that took off that I totally did not expect. And now I was being invited to the Ducks Unlimited dinners throughout the country and trade shows around the country with my duck paintings. This is not something I sought after. I have no affinity for ducks. But it was what the market bore, and it was uh, sustaining a family. And so I found myself at one particular trade show in Sacramento. A fellow, well, not one, many hunters had gone through that day and thrilled me with endless stories of hunting. And I realized that these are not my people and I need out. How to do that? I had a friend who right before that had left Ductum and uh, was now blissfully happy in the Andrew Wyeth country uh, Brandywine community painting hay wagons. And so I called to ask for advice, not that that's where I wanted to go. I didn't know where I wanted to go, I just know I didn't want to do ducks. And we had a conversation and he suggested that I paint children. I said, but how did you leave? And he said, I simply could no longer paint what didn't come from my heart. That was a turning point for me. First of all, I didn't quite understand what it is that he said. I had never found anything that really drove me from my heart to choose a topic to paint. It was always driven by money or acknowledgement. And so this was new, and when he suggested that I paint children because I was raising a family at the time and that was where my heart was, um, I gave that great thought. But most of my children were getting older and I realized they re really weren't doing anything that people would buy a painting of. And so I enlisted the neighbor's children and began to paint children. And as I took that to my gallery that I was presently with, they did not want them. They wanted the ducks. Obviously, it was uh, selling for them. And because my gallery was then based in Scottsdale, Arizona, their answer was always, no, people come on vacation here and leave the children behind. They don't want to be reminded of what's waiting at home. And so I continued to paint ducks, even big game for a little while, and trying to get out. And then in 1988, I was asked to compete in the National Arts for Parks competition. Artists from all, of, all over the country were competing in this. And the premise was that you were to paint a national park, and it would then be, the best would be chosen to be put on the, the stamp that would then be sold, and the revenue would then help to support the national parks. Uh, James Watt, I believe, was the uh, director of interior at the time. And uh, I had no interest in competing in this because, like ducks, landscape is right up there for me. And so I tried gracefully to get out of this assignment, but in the end, I had to accept. And so I tried to remember the last time I'd been to a national park. Didn't go much as a child. My father was a bookkeeper for a canning company. 
And so there was no time that he could go in the summer to vacation. And so it was an unfamiliar experience to me, except for one, where I went to, where we went to Zions National Park. And uh, he didn't exactly know how to take a vacation. We packed some grocery bags and put them in the trunk of the car and took off for Zions with four little kids in the back seat. And, and here's the key, my father was deaf, so he would turn off his hearing aid uh, in order to not hear what was going on in the back seat. It must have been fun for my mother, but as we arrived in Zions, I don't remember really stopping anywhere. And, uh, and as he drove past the Great White Throne, the hearing aid goes back on, and he wants to hear all of the cheers in the back seat. We're wanting to get out and run. And uh, he turns the car around. It looks promising, but instead he just points out the Great White Throne one more time, and we head back to Perry. That was my experience in a national park. And it was perfect for the mood I was in in order to complete this assignment. So with attitude, I painted three little boys hanging out the back of a camper, looking at the reflection of the giant redwoods in the window of the camper. And then just for a little bit of a uh, snit, at the end, I painted those stickers they used to see on the campers in the 50s, those trophies of when you go to a national park. And, uh, but I painted them like they were peeling off. I fully expected to be let go from the gallery. It was an act of defiance. But instead, I was invited to come and accept the Founders' Favorite Award, which would have placed fourth out of 3,000 entries. It sent a very clear message that I could now paint children, and I didn't paint ducks after that. Why, I, why do I tell you all of this? Because this was all preparation for what was going to follow and how my life was going to change. Again, I had not chosen to paint anything that came from my heart and the advice of my friends. So, here we are, we're painting children, and things have changed in my life. I am remarried, I have five children, my oldest son is returning home from his mission, things look pretty good, and I have taken two years off from painting. At the time, I didn't think I would ever go back to painting, it was just too much fun shopping. But the time had come that there was an obvious void in my life, and it drew me back to find what it was, and realizing that it was the gift that I had ignored that I needed to get back to, I quickly surmised what was going on in the national market and set my sights on painting now fairies, ignoring the advice of the friend because fairies were selling fantasy art. And I came up with about, oh, half a dozen great paintings that I was then going to hopefully present to the Greenwich Workshop and be picked up as their new artist and the rest would be history and I would take on much of the reputation that you experienced Jim Christensen having. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, as I was in the middle and the throes of painting these fairies, my oldest son returns home from his mission, and this is going to play a huge part in the course my life will take. He wastes no time in getting engaged, and one Sunday evening, his uh, soon-to-be wife had come to our home for dinner, and with her, she brought along a tape of My Servant Joseph, composed by Kenneth Cope. I really didn't I really wasn't all that into pop music of the church at the time, but her question to me was, would I like to hear this music? And given the fact that we didn't want to mess up the marriage that was forthcoming, with glee I said, absolutely, I want to hear that. But in my heart, I had no desire to hear music about Joseph Smith. I grew up in the church. I knew the facts that you get in Sunday school, but that's not enough. If you're a member of a church, that's not enough. You have to do your own studies of this man to gain a testimony. And I did not have that. I had heard my father bear testimony every fast and testimony meeting of the, of the mission of Joseph Smith and of our Savior, but it was only a seed, and it had not been watered over those years. And so here I was going to listen to a music of Joseph about Joseph Smith, and very, again, the attitude set in. For me, an artist, being very visual, Joseph Smith had always taken on the look of um, stale, musty history sort of persona. Uh, those white stretch pants that he wore and, you know, always the, the view from the side, not flattering. I just was not interested. But she began to play the music. Her purpose was that she, uh, my other son was then serving in the New Hampshire mission and she was, had received a letter of how homesick he was and missed his brother that she was going to be marrying and she was going to send this tape for comfort to other brothers at another time who loved each other very much. And this might bring some comfort to him as he served. And so as I sat that day and I listened to the music, it did change the course of my life, 
not quickly, but it did change it. I found myself at some point in the middle of the night realizing that I needed to paint what I was listening to in this song, The Love of These Two Brothers, and it put in the context of their martyrdom. Now, that was a far cry from fairies, but it was only going to be a brief um, break, and I would paint it and then get right back to it. Um, but in the meantime, as I considered doing this, I had been touched by the music, but my frame of mind for all of my life was, how am I going to benefit from this? How is this going to pay off? How can I justify this? And so I thought, perhaps, if it's good enough, they'll put it on the cover of the Enzyme and I'll become an LDS artist. I could kind of have a second career going over here while I was doing the national one. And, uh, and although you would never say those things out loud, it sort of just always rolled around in the back of my mind. Well, that would be kind of nice if that happened. The thing is, you can fool a lot of people, but you cannot fool your Heavenly Father. And I was about to find this out. Um, as my son was returned home, I, uh, we, had, we had decided that we would, first of all, I decided I called my photographer and asked if he would find a model for Joseph Smith. I wasn't aware who was out there and, and portraying Joseph in the films. He worked for the motion picture studio. And, uh, and then also, I was uh, going to go to Nauvoo and do some study, quick study, and learn all that I could on Joseph Smith and his death, and then come back and do this painting. While I was there, there was a film playing in the Carthage Visitor Center, and the depiction of Joseph Smith in that film was just amazing. It opened up a new world for me and a perspective of Joseph Smith that I did not have. It mirrored what I felt when I listened to the music of Kenneth's. And that is that it put Joseph in more of an approachable place. He became a family man, and he loved people, and he was very human, and he drew breath. And that was in enticing to me. Um, the doctrinal things hadn't captured my attention, but, but the human side of Joseph Smith did. And so as I was watching the film and uh, the different things that would pass by, there was one part where Joseph was pulling sticks with a man, and the man happened to be my photographer, and I became very hopeful at that point that this was who he was going to ask to play Joseph. And as luck would have it, as I returned home, it was. His name was Cliff Cole, and he had agreed to portray Joseph for this painting, and one other that I had asked for since returning home, and that was Joseph saying goodbye to his family. Again, I had seen that in the film and wanted to create a painting of that. Always saying the right words, however, that I was serving my Heavenly Father and that I was sacrificing to do this, the things that are acceptable when you serve, things to say that are acceptable, that I'd heard all the time. But in my heart, I still hadn't convinced myself of what it was all about. We had about two weeks to prepare to do this shoot, and three things had to happen in that, that, three, in that two weeks. I needed to find authentic costuming. Before this, I was only doing fairies and wildlife. There was not a need to find anything authentic for the fairies. And, and then I needed to find a model for Hiram, and then also um, I needed to find a location that would be similar to that of the Carthage Jail. And at the time, the nursery in our meeting house had the same floor plan as the Carthage Jail, and I think there's something to that. So everything was set. I went to the temple the day of the shoot, asking for my Heavenly Father's help and s hoping that just perhaps, because this was such a noble cause that I had enlisted myself in, that maybe Joseph could just come from the other side of the veil and I could see what he really looked like so I could, put, I could get, the, get the edge on all the other artists out there painting him so I would really know. So if he could just come for a couple of minutes, I see him wander in the corridors of the Provo Temple, I wouldn't say a word and he could go back to what he was doing. It's ironic, it's ridiculous to think of it, but, but nevertheless, it was in my heart that that's what I wanted to have happen. Of course, he was a no-show, and uh, I took that to mean that I was going to be tested for the next few hours to see how serious I was about doing this, and that was okay, but it was four hours, and that was asking a lot. That afternoon, we were going to film Going as a Lamb, and then following that, we would film the martyrdom. And I met Cliff for the first time as he arrived on my doorstep. And he was engaging. He's quite humorous. And he very much looks like what we think Joseph Smith looks like. And delightful uh, gentleman. And we joked around a little bit. And I sent him off to change. And a few moments later, we were in the backyard ready to shoot. And he walked out in costume. And it kind of took my breath away. Um, I, however, wanted to continue that engaging conversation of uh, lightheartedness, but he had already gone into character. 
and uh, I was a little bit put off thinking, it's a good thing I'm not painting Joseph Smith because I don't think I could work with him, he's so temperamental. And so we filmed Going as a Lamb. It was fantastic. It turned out, it couldn't have been better. The wind blew on cue, the kids cried on cue, and I thought, wow, this is such a snap when you serve Heavenly Father. This is so easy, he just hands it to you. And so we then went to the nursery next door. And I walked across the parking lot by myself. Everyone else was there, including my son that had returned home from the mission. And I was a little annoyed that he was there because, as you know, return missionaries have a little bit of attitude. They just sort of think they know it all. And, and so I, I wasn't quite sure, and I was sure that he knew more than what I knew, but I didn't want him there to see how much I didn't know. So we were there at the, they were there at the nursery, and as I walked slowly over, I was praying for the inspiration that I needed to direct this shoot. And as I walked into the room, everyone was standing around waiting for me to begin direction. But everything that I had studied in those two weeks was gone. I had nothing to draw upon. It wasn't there, and I couldn't draw a single thought in what to tell them to do. I had Joseph and Hiram in costume. I had the film crew and uh, just a few friends that were there and my son. My son, I believe at that time, suggested that I have a prayer. And of course, my reaction was, I've already had a prayer today and I don't need to in one day, and so just move. I'm waiting for inspiration. And still nothing came except some time later, again, the petition to have a prayer. I believe he offered the prayer, and in that prayer was offered that I would have the peace and the knowledge of knowing what to do on how to film this, and that I would feel the spirit there, and that Joseph and Hiram, those characters, they would be able to play those, those roles correctly in the way that Heavenly Father would want them portrayed. He prayed for the photographer and for the camera equipment and all to go well, and then in conclusion, he asked if this is according to thy will. I had never added that to my prayers. I really felt like I was in charge and I could direct my Heavenly Father. Doesn't quite work that way. Um, I felt the peace and I felt the calm and absolutely no inspiration. I took that to mean that this was probably not something that I should be doing. I was ready to dismiss the group, and then Cliff came over, and he spoke to me briefly and said, you know, is there anything I can do? When I had asked my photographer to find a model, he tried to tell me at that time, it's very important who you choose to portray Joseph Smith. It has to be a man that has a worthy priesthood holder, and he has to love the prophet, and he has to be a humble human being. And I, had, I heard none of that. I was just intent on getting to Nauvoo, getting the facts, getting home, and dressing up somebody tall, rather large nose, and I could paint the rest in. But as Cliff came to me that day and asked if there was anything I could, he could do to help, I could see the character of this man coming through and how appropriate it was that he portrayed Joseph. He said that he had been trained in theater, and perhaps if we just went through those last couple of minutes of Joseph's life, and watch it play out that maybe I would see and receive the inspiration I needed and go from there and be able to film specifically what we wanted. It sounded like a good idea. And so Cliff basically directed uh, the model for Hiram and, and then directed the photographer to begin to roll the camera and, and I stood off to the side. It was amazing what was going to take place in those next few moments. Instantly, Hiram and Joseph sprung to the door. You could almost feel a mob behind the door. You could almost hear the pistols fire. And the profanity shouted, the hatred. Hiram fell. Joseph continued to fire for moments. Then he turned. He set down his imaginary pistol. He went to Hiram. He scooped him in his arms. And I watched the tears fall on Hiram's face. I can't speak for those in the room that day. 
but I came to understand what it meant to have a mighty change of heart. He gently set the body down. We finished what we needed there without saying a word. And everyone left except for Jim and Cliff, and we stood in that room for some time before we spoke. And Cliff said, I don't exactly know what you're doing here, but I want to share something with you. When I was asked to play Joseph in the Nauvoo Carthage films, I didn't seek that role. I did that as a favor to a friend who was the producer of that project, and I sat the night before we were to begin filming terrified. I couldn't help but think of the many people that would come to Nauvoo and to Carthage and who would see this image of Joseph that I would portray. What if I did it wrong? I did not want to be accountable for that. As I sat there alone in the dark, the presiding general authority walked in. He sat next to me and we talked. And then he took me upstairs and gave me a blessing. He told me in that blessing one thing I think that applies to you, Liz, indirectly. He said that when I was called upon to play Joseph that I would feel his heart, I would know his desires, and in some ways almost feel that mantle that he carried. And if the work that I was engaged in was of my Heavenly Father, those blessings would be mine. Days later I was in the Carthage jail ready to film, waiting for another film crew, and as I stood against the window looking out, Another Hiram sat in the window seat, and I began to think, what would it have been like for Joseph those last few moments of his life? He knew what was coming. Did Hiram know? He says, I began to hear the mob down the street. It was as if I could see these 200 men with blackened faces shouting with such anger and hatred, firing their pistols totally caught up in the mob, moving towards the jail, and then I could hear the footsteps come up those stairs. My adrenaline in my own body began to pump. And then the most remarkable thing of all, I had the knowledge that Joseph did not want Hiram there. He had pleaded with him to stay behind. But because of these brothers' loves that began from the beginning of their lives, they could not part in death, and together they would seal their testimonies. I don't know what you're doing here, Sister Swindle, but those same feelings came tonight in this nursery. Whatever it is, your Heavenly Father is behind it. And then he left. I didn't anticipate doing another painting, ever seeing Cliff again. And I walked slowly across that parking lot back to my home. And the conversation of a friend years ago came to my mind, came from your heart. Finally, I knew what is in my heart, what had always been there, what my father had taught me years before, would now have a chance to grow. I had never had an opportunity of painting something with such passion. And the question was, how do I paint what I felt in that room that day? How do I capture on canvas the feeling of the spirit? How do I paint the spirit? Over the years that would follow, I learned one thing, that the spirit will paint the spirit, and you will be the hands for the spirit to do that work if your heart is in the right place. I went home that night, and I pulled out the one book I had purchased in order to do this enormous study on Joseph. And then I saw the books my father had had years ago on Joseph Smith. And I began to take those from the shelves. And I began to read. And I began to study. 
and it became an obsession and a passion for me. I became better acquainted with who this man was, the personal side of Joseph Smith as well as the doctrinal side. You're going to be fed from the best scholars in the church on the life of Joseph Smith, and I do not fit in that category by any means, but what I can give you, the legacy that I will leave to my family and to the church, to the many people in the world who will look with eyes to see are these paintings of Joseph Smith that were painted by the Spirit. Within days, I had stretched the canvas to do the martyrdom. That is the piece that I chose to bring here today. I had read so many things by that point, a steady diet of things that others had said about Joseph Smith because I needed to really understand what he was like in order to put him on canvas and make it convincible, but also to make him reach out and touch people that weren't being touched like me growing up that hadn't been touched. There was a different way to portray Joseph Smith that would reach the others that weren't getting it, like myself. Josiah Quincy said this, a fine-looking man is what the passerby would instinctively have murmured upon meeting the remarkable individual who had fashioned the mold, which was to shape the feelings of so many thousands of his fellow mortals. Another comment. He is what you ladies would call a very good-looking man. Lydia Bailey said, a tall, well-built form with the carriage of an Apollo, brown hair and handsome blue, blue eyes that would pierce you with its gaze. Wandel May said he was a fine-looking man, tall and well-proportioned, strong and active and light complexion, blue eyes and light hair and very little beard. He had a free and easy manner, not the least affect affectation, yet bold and independent and very interesting and eloquent in speech. I had found the right model for that, and I began to put it on canvas. And another remarkable thing happened during the course of painting this painting, which took about two months. I wanted to paint Joseph Smith as just everything that everyone had said about him and put that physical being on canvas, but I needed to make sure they saw the spiritual side of him as well. That moment when he was going to leave this life, this life that he had lived that was a life filled with persecution and doubt for, from others and betrayal, and yet the constant companionship of his Lord and Heavenly Father. This was a challenge to do, and one of the most interesting things that happened is my mother passed away during the course of this painting being painted. I've never been with someone when the spirit leaves to her home. It was a marvelous experience to be with my mother, and at the time I wasn't aware of what my mind, my brain was taking in. But as I sat at the easel, weeks later, I began to paint the face of Hiram, all of which my brain had logged came out and I understood the flesh of someone whose spirit had just left. And it was a gift. The love the saints had for him was inexpressible, says Mary Alice Lambert. They would willingly have laid down their lives for him. If he was to talk, every task would be laid aside that they might listen to his words. He was not an ordinary man. Saints and sinners alike felt and recognized a power and influence which he carried with him. It was possible to meet him and not be impressed by the strength of his personnel. It was impossible to meet him and not be impressed by the strength of his personality and his influence. Joseph would have been heartbroken to have his brother go to his death with him. Moments later, they would be taken to their rest. I know that this is not probably an accurate depiction of the martyrdom. As Willard Richards said, he went to the window. No time to stop at the body. That's okay. It wasn't the literal part of Joseph Smith I was painting. Let it be said of this work that's been done of Joseph Smith that Liz Lemon Swindle knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I 
I read where when Joseph and Hiram were going into the cell of the jail in Carthage, that he turned to Willard and said, will you come with us? And Willard said, you didn't ask me to come across the river. You didn't ask me to come to Carthage. And you did not ask, did not ask me to come here, but if you're, if you're tried for treason and you're found guilty, and are, are guilty and, and sentenced to be hung, hanged, I will hang for you. I feel as Willard Richards. I would give my life for this man. And in some small measure, that is what I've done. I was flying home from Independence when the show was there in 1997, and behind me, about two rows back, there was a row of young men who had had a little too much liquor, and it was getting a little bit out of hand, and I was sketching a sketch of Joseph Smith. I had been in the visitor center painting while the show was there, and I would fly home on the weekends. I was able to be there and listen to the many people that saw the paintings, the originals, and they would bear testimony of how these paintings had touched their lives and what they meant to them. And as I'm flying home that day, one would think after a steady diet of that for a week, it would not be hard to stand up and defend the prophet. But as I am flying home that day and aware of what's going on two rows back, the steward or the flight attendant says to me, who is this that you're sketching? This is beautiful. I didn't want the name Joseph Smith to be heard by these three young men. I wasn't sure what they would do with it. And I did not step up to the plate. I simply said, he is a friend. And as she stood and walked away, I wanted to go after her and bring her back and sit her down and say, wait. Let me tell you what he did. Let me tell you tell you what your life can become. If you will come to know him for his, as the prophet that he is. But the opportunity had passed. And I went home with the resolve that I would never shriek if I was ever given the chance again. The next week I'm flying home again again sketching, and again another flight, st flight attendant asking those same questions, who is this? This time I was ready. The answer was simply, sit down. <laughs> Let me tell you about him. She of course had enough within about a minute, but as she tried to stand up to leave, I would keep pulling her down. Let me tell you one more thing. I love this man. You will hear many marvelous things today be fed with facts and history that you won't find anywhere else. Just remember this when you leave. That I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God for a day to lead the restoration. Gospel of our Lord was restored through his living prophet, Joseph Smith. I know that. I feel it to my core. I know it as I breathe. I know that the Savior lives and what he gave up for me and how intimately involved he is in my life. And I have a testimony of a living prophet. Think of what he passed through, says George Buchanan. Think of his afflictions and think of his dauntless character. Did anyone ever see him falter? Did anyone ever see him flinch? Did anyone ever see any lack in him of power necessary to enable him to stand with dignity in the midst of his enemies or lacking in dignity in the performance of his duties as servant of the living God that I have testimony of? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.
This address by Liz Swindle was given at the Sydney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 29, 2005.